this episode was supposed to be a standard issue podcast, maybe even a little boring, admittedly, but instead it's the most thought provoking episode I've ever produced. <laughs> Here's how it started. I don't know this woman. What if she's a square? You know, I don't know what I thought, right? So you may have noticed something's a little off. Maybe my lighting's a little too bright. Dana, my guest, is in a hotel room. Something, I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that I sound like a fucking chipmunk. And make no mistake, Dana heard me in exactly this voice as well. But when I reached out to her, she said, Oh, I thought you had a cold. A cold. When I got her email back, I thought, This bitch. And she didn't realize something was wrong with my microphone. Then I backed up a little bit and listened to the beginning. What if she's a square? You yeah, who know what I thought, right? I told her straight up I thought she was going to be boring as fuck. And if she did any research into my background at all, she probably thought I was trolling her. So if she wasn't going to get trolled. She was going to be the troll. Well, she is a consummate professional because here's what she said. I perform very differently depending upon the vibe. I mean, Dana, hats off, girl. She responded appropriately to the situation. And so as a result, what we have is an entire podcast where I sound like a chipmunk and she sounds like a perfectly normal academic talking to a chipmunk. So to spare your ears and to give you a little, I guess, VH1 style pop-up video type thing, I am going to curate the most salient moments from the podcast like this and comment on them so you don't have to listen to me as a chipmunk. But before I do, let me explain to you how the chipmunk thing happened. First of all, I got a new microphone. It came with its very own little mixing station. I tested it before the episode. And I'm testing this fucking microphone. Is it a good microphone? The question is, can it be that far away from my mouth? Does it have to be really close to my mouth? What if I turn the music up? If I push this button, will there be laughing? How about a gunshot? How about some applause? What if I said, don't boo me? Wonder what slapping sounds like. What if I do something with the fucking pitch? What if I'm a bitch? Holy sh shit. Like, <laughs> that's awful. So I was testing it. It just so happened that I ended the testing session with the pitch all the way up. So my bad. But ultimately, we're going to make this into a positive because I can't tell you how sick I am of podcasts and podcasting. So let's see if we like the way this plays out. If you enjoy it, let me know. As always, thank you for hanging out with me and it wouldn't be possible without you. Welcome to Neo Academia. I'm your host, Natasha Mott. And on this episode, political scientist and communications researcher, Dana Young, talks to a chipmunk about her new book, Wrong, where she describes how media can drive your appetite for misinformation. Media like podcasts. Wait, what? Anyways, this episode is possible thanks to Theory Gang Substack subscribers and, of course, our sponsor, Big Nerve. I've been working with Big Nerve for a while now to develop a community of innovative, creative thinkers, and their goal is simple. They want to recognize and fund creative thinkers. They're trying to create an entire new profession of innovation where catalysts like me could ask interesting and engaging questions and innovators like you can answer them. There are many different ways to play. You can ask questions, answer them, rate answers, mentor answers. All of this earns you points. At the end of the month, these idea tournaments pay out to the top 30 participants and everybody gains some more experience points and gets known for their expertise. This game is meant to elevate creative thinkers and their ideas. To join my team, you'll have to click on the Big Nerve question in the Theory Gang newsletter, where each episode I'll design a special question relevant to the guest and discussion. All right, here's the episode. Now don't forget to listen all the way to the end for the question. The path to redemption is being open to being wrong. Yeah. Well, you know, your whole book is about why we're wrong, how we're wrong. Like, so how do we get right? The notion that just being open to the possibility you might be wrong makes us more likely to be right. This concept of intellectual humility that if we just go through our day not holding on so tightly to our pre-existing beliefs, but just going about our day through the lens of like wonder and curiosity, that is what will bring us to truth. 
I think it's a luxury in some ways to be able to not hold on so tightly to those things. We've all been in positions where either because of crisis or tragedy or stress or uncertainty, we have to hold on tightly to that stuff. But if you allow yourself to look through that lens of openness, the world looks completely different. Case in point, this episode. When I first saw the audio was fucked up, all these thoughts went through my mind that were very egocentric. I fucked up. Dan is terrible. What am I going to do? I got to throw this episode out. When I took a step back and went, wait a second, I realized that this could be fun. I'm so sick of fucking podcasts. I would rather watch a video of a talking head. So at this point, I told Dana, I think that we as a society will come to this openness through struggle, through strife, through cynicism. We have to go through it. That's the only way. And that led to a really good discussion that has minimal chipmunkiness. But do you know what's so funny, Natasha, though, is that that probably speaks to other aspects of your personality or training and open-mindedness through therapy, because a lot of folks who go through pain and suffering go in the opposite direction. You know, you'll see those, those tweets all the time that always make me laugh. Like a man would rather, you know, buy an AR-15 than go to therapy. How about a gunshot? Pain is not something that many of us want to sit in. And so it seems like an attractive thing to become more closed off, more ego-centered, doubling down on social identity, doubling down on uh, feelings of protectiveness and in versus out group. But all of those things, like they're all an illusion of control. I talk in, in the book a bit about how our need for control and power largely, you know, drives us to believe certain things sometimes that might not be true. And I always joke that like control and power. Yeah, that's why I have like five different wrinkle creams that I know none of them work, but I, I need control and I need power. So I believe in the fiction of retinol. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it works. I mean, retinol, there's, there's a good amount of evidence. I don't know, Natasha. Oh, don't I'm, tell me wrong. Retinol is probably the only thing that's going to work. But the problem is I don't have a control group. Like, I don't know what my face looked like in the non-retinol condition. Yeah. You know? Let, let's be for real. We're comp a good combination of retinol and Botox is the way. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, I have, to, I have to get on the Botox train then. Anyway, so, so my need for control causes me to believe in bullshit, right? Well, you know, terror management theory says that we're all on this quest as humans to deal with the fact that because we have these giant frontal lobes and we can imagine things, we are able to imagine our own death and contemplate our own mortality. And that's awful and it sucks. And so a lot of the things that we do in our daily life are things to distract ourselves from or create an illusion of control with regards to death. And I'm like, well, that's depressing as hell. Until you allow yourself to, to, you know, channel a little bit of Buddha and be like, is it depressing or am I going to be open to this? Embracing death is the only way that can really be our authentic self. So we took a slight high to Gary in turn here and started talking about philosophy, which I noted we are not particularly open to as a society at this point. Moving into like the post-truth era, we're going to have to contend with the fact that we might not be right or wrong about the vast majority of things. Wow. That, I don't even know what to do with that. I feel like I, feel like I need a martini for this one. It's, it's, it's one in the afternoon where I am, Natasha. This is breakfast conversation for me, honey. Well, this is, these are some of the thoughts that I have when, when I read article after article about artificial intelligence. If artificial intelligence is merely drawing upon, you know, all of the artifacts, all the cultural artifacts and symbols that we've already created, which themselves are not necessarily authentic, but they're all constructed through pressures of capitalism and monetization and strategy, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, what are all of these resulting texts going to be for? What is their meta narratives? Before I got into the 
business of misinformation research. I, I'm trained as a media effects researcher. So I, I will run surveys and experiments on effects of exposure to various media content on attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And I studied the effects of political satire and late night comedy for 20 years. And, you know, when I would teach my media and society class to my 200 students, I'd say, let's just think for a second about what would happen if right now, let's imagine there was a rapture, but it was like a generous rapture that took all of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like you didn't just have to accept Jesus, like everybody could go. And then aliens land and they only can understand us through our media products and our cultural art. I'm like, who are we? And the students are like, we're horrible. <laughs> we're horrible. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're horrible. So now, but now with, with what's going on with AI and large language models, it takes that thought experiment to a whole other level. Because it's not just like aliens are going to come down and like witness stuff and be like, oh, wow, they're horrible. It's like, those are the texts and the products that are going to inform the next texts and products. And we are on a path to badness. <laughs> it's like, oh, if it isn't the consequences of my own choices and actions. I love when we talk about capitalism or when we talk about this kind of stuff, but especially I love when we talk about corporations nowadays, it's like corporations are evil. And like, you do realize it's humans that created corporations, humans that run corporations. The idea that institutions are just people, there are a lot of folks who push back against that when I say that. Um, they're like, no, 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 because institutions are different because they're structural and there's constraints and da, da, da. I'm like, yes, they're structural and there are constraints that have been put in place by people. <laughs> Institutions are people. Um, I find it super empowering to think about institutions as people. It's individuals plus causal emergence. It's the idea that on a micro level, individuals are one thing. And then when you put them all together on the next level, you have this thing that is more than the sum of its parts because something else emerges from that. So that may be what the pushback is, is it's like, it's, it's people plus. And the problem with the plus is that sometimes the plus is beautiful and loving. And sometimes the plus is like murderous and toxic. Yeah. And like, how do, how, what, what causes the one plus versus the other? Where's that little linchpin? I don't know. That's the concept of like mechanistic interpretability of like, can we look into the individuals and see what, what little equations came together to make that thing happen? And in that respect, I think we're headed for good things because we might be able to massage those things out in certain instances. Now, speaking of mechanistic interpretability and massaging things out, I really kind of had some beef with Dana about something she said on a podcast previously. Dana was asked on a podcast who she thought embodied intellectual humility, and she said, Tony Fauci. Girl, what? Because I represent science. I'm the Lorax, guardian of the forest. I speak for the trees. When I was thinking about Tony Fauci, I wasn't thinking about that sort of rhetorical put foot directly in mouth. I, when you have scientists show up on programs, a lot of times they make for pretty sh shitty television guests. Because they huh? say the evidence at present is pointing in this direction. You know, th there's not absolute consensus, but overwhelmingly suggests this. Like, no, 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 no. And I was thinking about how in the early days of COVID, you know, Tony Fauci was like, this is what the data suggests right now. It could change. We are monitoring it. People hated that. I think in general, people want certainty from leaders. Um, science does not give certainty. Science gives probabilities, which people are freaking horrible at dealing with. I was trying to think about like, are there examples of intellectual humility in practice that we even see? And the answer is not a lot. So of course this led into a COVIDian misinformation discussion. Do you really think it, that, that, the, that some of those early policies were a, a control grab by design? Yeah, I think a lot of people do, yes. I do. For what? For rightness. Because like when I think about, okay, so we were hosting an event in March and everybody was shutting down their events. They were like, okay, we're not going to do this event. And it was like social pressure to feel like you're doing the right thing. We're the right people. We're the right, we're on the right side of history. So I don't necessarily mean like maniacal political control. I mean control of the future, control of the narrative, control of who was on the right side of history. I was one of those people that was 
super afraid of COVID. And my husband was like, uh, the school should not shut down. And I was like, yes, they should. They absolutely should shut down. He's like, kids really do not die of COVID. And if they do, it's tiny numbers or they have other conditions. Blah, blah, blah. I think when we look back and if you look at the science and you look at the studies and you look at the effects on young people's mental health, I do think the scientific community is like, oops. Yeah, we, we, we looked at the risk and we looked at the potential benefit and we did the wrong thing. You know, I'm an optimist. I think that, and this is where I'm not like most of my social scientist friends. I think that people are fundamentally good. And I think it is very hard to translate shades of gray from scientific probabilities into workable policy solutions. Like I said, toothpaste can't go back in tube. And this is why I'm so interested in AI policy. And, and now all of a sudden it's like, well, <laughs> choose how you're going to move forward. You might die or you might suffer a totalitarian existence worse than death. <laughs> you appear to be a very standard academic. But that standard academic discussion with a chipmunk. <laughs> That's the biggest insult I've ever heard. You look like a normie. <laughs> no, but I actually really like you now because you just said the thing that like, I don't think I've really ever heard an academic say, you know, I don't know. And I don't think I have to fucking know. Academics have to justify their existence as experts uh -huh. in the uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I just was on an interview with a media outlet and the, the journalist was so sweet. But after the third time when I said, I could give you an answer, but I actually don't know. He was like, we're good here. <laughs> I'm going to call my next one. I'm going to quote Drake right now. I don't know why I do this Ooh. so often, but the real is on the rise. Fuck them other guys. I even gave them a chance to decide. Nah, something they know. Awful. People who enjoy my stuff know what the Drake equation is and who Drake the rapper is. <laughs> like... On that note, we transition into talking about memes and political humor and satire. And I tell Dana the story of how in 2016, I happened to be in New York and saw a Trevor Noah taping. And I was just kind of grossed out with political punditry. And I think we're moving away from that in a formal sense. But yet people on meme pages and people who run various social media accounts are looked at as kind of mini political pundits. Here's what Dana has to say. That speaks to the salience of social identity. That's just, I need to know if Natasha's on my team or not. Like, if I, to know what I think of her and how I'm gonna engage with her or any of her content, I need to know if she's with me or against me. It's actually quite childish when you think about it. When my son was young, he had a collection of like superhero figurines and he loved sorting them. Right. Here's the heroes and here's the villains. And the one that always boggled his mind was the Hulk. Because it's like he's so angry and big, but he's with the good. He'd always put the Hulk in a different, like the middle, you know. You know, and my daughter, when she was around the same age as well in elementary school, whenever I'd be watching anything on TV, she would say, are they good or are they bad? Which, if you think about it, like from a child's perspective, children are very high in need for closure. They're, they have low tolerance for ambiguity. They're trying to make sense of their world. And one of the easiest ways to make sense of the world is evaluatively, good or bad. And so many people, if they are thinking in terms of social identity, that's their governing question. Is she good or bad? Do we like her? Yeah. Well, guess what? I'm not your mean mommy. Like, that's... <laughs> I studied irony for years, and irony causes a lot of trouble for people. Uh-oh. Bo both for the ironic message sender and for the irony consumer. I'm a media effects scholar and not like a literary scholar. To me, the meaning of a text does not reside in the text. The meaning of a text resides in the intersection between the person and the text. And people don't love that. Because they're like, no, that means something. Like to you, there is the opportunity to bring someone along and to urge them towards a particular conclusion. But individual differences matter. Individual experiences, psychological traits, processing motivations. And that I love that stuff. Like the idea of like, how come 
those three people are looking at the same meme and they come away with completely different interpretations. One of them's mad, one of them's laughing, and one of them is now, you know, going to go buy something. I don't know. And for the record, this is why I post memes, because I want to hear what other people have to say about it. Not just the people who come across it initially. There's a secondary response. When you know that it's posted as a meme, I want to know what you have to say about it. I think there's some kind of collective consciousness there. And I wanted to talk to Dana about this particularly because this is what she studies. I think there's a big problem with trying to study the collective consciousness and what we really think as a society, because who owns access to all of that data? The platform. So a researcher like Dana can't just go extract the data and observe all of us the way that Jane Goodall observed monkeys in Gombe. The platforms own it. So the best these researchers can do is create a mock environment and try to reconstruct it. But Dana explains all the problems with this. Let's say that I want to look at the effects of memes, uh, particular kinds of memes. And maybe I identify a certain genre of meme. And so I get a collection of them, a sample of them. So now, how am I going to look at effects? Am I going to put those memes in front of a random sample of people? What if it's a random sample of people that never in the normal world, have ever would have ever encountered them in the first place? What if the kinds of people that would have encountered them in the first place themselves have particular predilections or predispositions that brought them into that space? So now when I do my study, I have created a completely artificial environment with people that never would have encountered them in the first place, that do not hold those psychological and social predispositions that are driving their interpretation and all of that. I mean, I think that some of the the opportunity for innovations in methodology and analysis in my field are huge. But, you know, old folks like myself, we have like a failure of imagination. If I can't like pop that video cassette in a VCR and play it and then ask you what you thought of it, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is how I feel like meta shields itself from having to deal with any possible implications of their platform. Because they hide behind this, like, oh, we cannot share anonymized data with you because it would violate our users' privacy. Baloney. Okay. What that means is that the mechanisms that we use or, or the, the, the methods that we use to test mechanisms of effects are always taking place outside of Facebook. Not always, not always, but largely they're taking place outside of meta platforms, right? So we'll create um, proxies of the way the processes might work, which means in terms of ecological validity, it's very low. You can't replicate the scale and just the grandiosity of meta. However, we as social scientists and media scholars and sociologists cannot ignore everything we already know about human behavior and exposure to symbols and exposure to imagery and effects on cognitions and effects on emotions. Really, the issue for me, what's most challenging, what kind of we've been skirting around is this concept of intertextuality, which is that the meaning of any text is contingent on exposure to and reception of other texts in the environment. And for every individual, that means that the effects of exposure to a given message are completely different. I just feel like some of, the, some of these platforms really want researchers to be like, well, if I can't study it in its natural habitat, I can say nothing. And this is partly why I'm so against blocking the spread of misinformation. Because how do we actually know what is misinformation right now and what is just premature science? Her point is that we still have to try and study these things, and I agree. However, when people ask for citations, I kind of just roll my eyes in certain circumstances because a lot of the data is not applicable or it's out of context. I work in biotech and pharma. They do this shit all the time. They're like, well, we didn't study it in that context. In what I do, there's something called off-label use of a, of a product, right? So I go on in my very professional chipmunk voice to explain to Dana that this seems analogous to what I see in my career, where biotech and pharmaceutical companies will deal with off-label use of their products through education and issuing caveats. We're not promoting it this way. They just happen to be using it. That's a great analogy. I love that. 
I'm writing this down, Natasha. I think companies try and find ways to deal with these kinds of things so that they can offload responsibility. True. Oh, 100%. I mean, I am, I'm often talking to my students about how, like, capitalism is great. The free market is great until it's not. Efficiency has a lot of negative outcomes. Yeah. And I think one of them is, is polarization in, in an effort to be efficient, in an effort to know which way to go, what decisions to make. We look at them. Tolerance, tolerance for uncertainty. Where do you see the opportunities for this in society? Mm. Increase our tolerance for uncertainty. Yeah. So tolerance for ambiguity, it is, there is some evidence that it is a rather stable trait. And so there is a link between um, tolerance for ambiguity and psychophysiological systems that are what we consider low in interpersonal threat monitoring. So what does that mean? If you are someone who is not always concerned about the threat that might be lurking around the corner, there are certain luxuries that you have as a result of that. You do not feel the need to come to decisions as quickly, to use heuristic. And where we see tolerance for ambiguity grow, interestingly, is after people get college degrees, right? Liberal arts educations tend to increase tolerance for ambiguity. So the opposite of tolerance for ambiguity is this need for closure, where you need certainty, you need predictability, you're uncomfortable with things that are not routine. Think about our messaging environment. Think about, you know, especially our political messaging environment. There's a lot telling us all the time that things are chaotic and things are stressful. So it's not that surprising that, you know, there's not a whole lot of tolerance for ambiguity. I have a hypothesis that tolerance for ambiguity can be increased by sending people through kind of like little episodes of ambiguity. Not too harmful, of course, and I think the same is true for xenophobia, multiculturalism, and tolerance for other people in general. I think people who are very tolerant have a hard time picking a side. There is such a social pressure to make your public declaration of allegiance. And then once you make your public declaration of allegiance, because we are ego-driven and we want to be seen as moral and righteous, we're not going to change. So then we go on to talk about Starbucks and why people need these cultural icons, especially corporate ones, to say something about their particular team. And it has to do with corporate personhood. So, of course, then we get into talking about Citizens United. Our media environment is terrible at covering structures and institutions because there's no visuals that are like sexy. You know, it's television. Internet, it's like a visual medium. We want people doing cuckoo things loudly and aggressively. And that's Donald Trump. So we get them all the time. What we don't have is like coverage of campaign finance reform because it's not a guy, <laughs> right? We need the, um, the new on Capitol Hill guy. We need a mascot. I was involved in some research on um, Stephen Colbert and John Oliver in their coverage of Citizens United. And th those, I mean, granted, it was over 10 years ago or whatever, they did a really good job of distilling that issue, making it super accessible and understandable. And their viewers came away, not only understanding the issue, but like feeling efficacious about it. Breaking news from like 10 years ago. I'm going to interrupt this already abnormally scheduled podcast to bring you a video from the nonprofit organization Represent Us. In this video, they're going to demonstrate to you how fucked up campaign finance reform is and why it matters to you. For the last few years, I've had this sense that everything I learned as a kid about how America's government works is completely wrong. But I had no idea how bad things actually were until I saw this one graph. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. 
Now, take an incredibly popular idea. The most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just going to quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. But there's a catch. This flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. When they want something, the government is much more likely to do it. And when they don't, they have the power to completely block it from happening, no matter how much the rest of the country supports it. So we need a little more of that. Unions and corporations and organizations can give unlimited funds to ca campaigns and candidates. Who do you think is going to actually be giving money? And do you think that they are organizations and entities that are going to put money behind really moderate interests. Probably not. The normie money doesn't exist. So I go on to say how I think normie money is kind of situated in these nonprofits, like FIRE, for example. These are exactly the kind of organizations who could take up the cause, but they'd have to kind of fall on the sword. Because once they started talking about big companies that are potential donors, they're not going to get that normie money anymore. But I do think free speech organizations could take this cause up because Citizens United basically says that money equals speech. I'm not going to hold my breath and neither will Dana. In fact, she's got a little bit of beef with free speech organizations. I always love watching like, OK, whose who's speech are they protecting? Whose causes are they protecting? And I don't think she's wrong. Free speech is on attack from both sides. See other episodes of my podcast. Dana disagrees, though. She sees the problem in a different light. The interview that I was just doing with, um, I don't want to spread misinformation. I, I don't even remember. Your, you don't know who you did an interview no, with? No, because it's, it's, some, it's either, <laughs> it was either Inside Higher Ed or Chronicle for Higher Ed. I don't know. We're talking a little bit about the folks who are working in the space of mis and disinformation. Many of them are also, like, not advocating direct censorship of posts or accounts. Because there's a large understanding that censorship itself is probably not going to remedy some of these issues upstream, right? Instead, friction, speed bumps, interventions, um, content moderation is not just taking down accounts and taking down posts. Content moderation a lot of times is community notes. Here's some more context. Here's some more information so you can learn more. A lot of times it's more information, not removal of information. And most folks working in the mis- and disinformation space are also not on board with the idea of governments being charged with misinformation and disinformation policing. Those regulations are used as weapons. For example, the Weaponization Committee, you know, Jim Jordan's Weaponization Committee, and looking at misinformation researchers, exploring these allegations that misinformation researchers were coordinating with the government and to censor right-wing voices. But you're saying it didn't happen? Am I saying it didn't happen? Yeah. No, what I'm saying is that the biggest censorship of all is that through this Weaponization Committee, now there is a cooling off in terms of research into this space. And there is no greater censorship than shutting down the production of knowledge. So that's the kind of thing I'm interested in is like, okay, so if you're interested in free speech, do you also see that some of the efforts of committees like this to subpoena researchers are also having effects on free speech? I just see a speed bump for left-leaning ideology. It's no secret that liberal, secular ideology has monopoly over knowledge production in the United States. And as a liberal secularist, I support this message. No, I, I, I very much disagree. When you look at the empirics on falsehoods online, whether it be the environment, elections, like mail-in ballots and fraudulent et cetera, et cetera. The misinformation in the online environment is asymmetrical politically. 
Perhaps there is something we're missing in the asymmetrical production of misinformation, a clue. And I wonder if there's some kind of bias afoot here. But Dana says no. I mean, unless you... No. No. Because here's the thing. We're not just talking about one study. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of studies. Unless you, unless it would be through the mechanism of them operationalizing what is true. This, this is what I did not have the language to describe, but Dana put it perfectly. The left operationalizes the truth, meaning they set the standard, not only in knowledge production, but also culturally. And nothing is perfectly objective. There is an element of metaphysical and subjective in everything. Let's take educational achievement, for example. We can all probably agree that educational achievement has been operationalized to mean good grades. But we all kind of sense something's fishy with that definition because y'all know people who have a college degree are dumber than a box of rocks. You can get good grades and still have no critical thinking skills, a total lack of social and emotional development. I mean, what the heck is educational achievement if not a well-rounded person? The same could be said for the example of the elections. We operationalize the fact that we all get a vote. But the truth is that corporations have an outsized voice thanks to Citizens United. Getting back to the concept of knowledge production, I stand by the fact that the left has operationalized the concept of truth. For better or for worse, I tend to think that the left believes a little bit too strongly in the power and breadth of science, and the right believes the exact opposite. And both of them are persuaded by a need for moral superiority. A lot of it is very social and emotional. And so the, everything that you're pointing to right now, which I agree with, it's about a sense of being condescended to. It's a sense of arrogance. It's a sense of status inflation. I, I don't like being judged. I don't like being made to feel like I'm stupid. Those are social and emotional factors that, are at, that we actually should think of separately from these cognitions themselves. If the left is more likely to be empirically accurate, perhaps it is incumbent upon the left to not be so douchey. <laughs> right? Wait, I started the book and the way that I ended the book, like I had to kind of go back to the beginning of the book because what I got through my own writing was such a sense of like empathy and understanding and like compassion. Cause like, we're all just trying to understand what the fuck is going on. We're trying to feel like we have some control over what the fuck is going on. And we want to have a sense of community as we deal with what the fuck is going on. Thanks for hanging out. I swear to God, I did not do this on purpose, but I am glad that it happened. I feel like podcasting as a medium is lacking. But let me know what you thought about this style. Thanks to Dana Young, she was amazing and exceeded all of my expectations. If you're interested in learning more about Dana's work and her personal stories on misinformation, you can check out her book, Wrong. I still think she thought she was getting trolled. Either way, she was talking to a chipmunk and thus put on a stellar performance. We'll see you for the next episode on free speech. All right, here's the Big Nerve Challenge question. How could we reframe the discussion about what it means to be wrong? Head over to my substack, theorygang.substack.com, or just head over to Big Nerve and search away. You lied to me, Natasha. We, we know some stuff. I feel deeply, Natasha. So, like, I, I'm, I'm in the moment. Douchey. <laughs> okay, well, I, I have research to do.